Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the, this is going to be the panel discussion. Um, the panel is really geared towards what's next for the Linux app ecosystem. And a lot of this is about, you know, we've spent, I don't know, six, seven years uh, doing this conference. It's our seventh year. And we built an incredible amount of trust between distros, uh, desktop projects, third-party developers. And now that we've sort of built some of that, that trust, where do we take this and where do we want to go? And some of these questions are um, under that kind of category. And um, so I think the first thing we'll do is we'll start with some introductions. And Heather, you want to sort of kick this off? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Heather Ellsworth. I um, am part of the GNOME community and the Ubuntu community. I work for Canonical, and I work mostly on Snap stuff. Hi, I'm Felipe. I am from the GNOME and Fedora communities. I work for Red Hat. Hey, I'm Lubos. I work for SUSE. I am release manager for OpenSUSE Leap. We are building a new version of Leap, which will be somehow related to Flatpex. Hello, I'm Jason Evangelo. I do marketing and uh, social media for Thunderbird. Hey, I'm Rob McQueen. So I work at the NSOS Foundation. Uh, I'm on the board of GNOME, and I'm in kind of the core team for FlatHub. Um, hi, I'm Alish. I am a KD developer, KDV president, and a friend of them all. All right, excellent. And so as we know, we have a great cross-section of folks in the app ecosystem, and um, I couldn't ask for a better set of panel members. So, you guys all ready for your first question? Bring it. Okay. <laughs> there have been many conversations online about the interoperability of apps running on the GNOME KDE and other desktops. What would be the ideal vision of interoperability? Um, interoperability is not given. This is something we need to fight for. I think it's worth it, and that's why we're here. I think that it's some work that we need to do collectively, and we're doing it, and here we are. I mean, specifically, last it's because of it. Right? Yeah, I mean, that nothing's, nothing's perfect, right? But I feel like we're working in the right direction. Things like portals are actually a, a, a true kind of like a, a venue for cross-desktop collaboration and development. So we have like an API for Linux applications that works on GNOME, works on KDE, works on whatever other system you care to, to use. Um, so very practically in terms of code and collaboration in, in venues like this, it's kind of being hashed out. It's not perfect, right? But I think we're in a very good place. Um, previously, there have been you know, these kind of been and gone efforts where we've, we've made a bunch of standards and then not touched them for 15 years and things. So just that we're here and that we're active and things is, is really good to see. Uh, I'm not a developer, so I, c I tend to look at things from the perspective of a, I guess, typical user, sometimes a non-technical user. Um, and I would just say the end goal is when the user doesn't have to concern themselves with what platform am I on, what OS am I on, what extra steps do I need to take. When all that melts away, then that's, we've won. That's that's the end game for me. Yeah, I kind of heard it yesterday on discussions, and I feel there will be some challenge to kind of make like maybe a common dialogue in some cases, like printing dialogue is one of the cases, right? Where if you run KDE, kind of still open the GTK-based dialogue. And I feel like some people will not be comfortable with, with the default that was chosen. So there is a space for a lot of collaboration, and yeah, some people will have to just, you know, agree on something. <laughs> And I see that being a challenge, especially with the many distributions and the same with platforms. So yeah, I mean, collaboration will be the key. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, we need to definitely invest on portals uh, becoming more accessible and easier to implement for application developers and uh, the developer experience as, as a whole, right? I think that the adoption of our platform really depends on attracting young generation of developers, new people who are going to be building apps so we can scale things. Yeah, I, I think that whenever we try and approach a problem, we need to consider all the other stakeholders that might use that technology as well and reach out to them and make sure that, yeah, collaboration is at top of mind. It doesn't need to be team this or team that. It can just be team free software for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, yeah, just collaboration and, and keeping that mindful and having 
progressive conversations about things to find common solutions. Great answers. So the next question kind of builds off that one. How can we provide a better out-of-the-box experience for app consumption? For? App consumption. I, since I've got the microphone, I'll start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll just keep going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's efficient, right? Um, I, I think that for general app consumption, we need to have better accessibility. And we've got a workshop on that a little bit later. Um, but anybody that is, you know, visually or um, audibly disabled will notice that there are significant gaps. And I, I understand that it's uh, there's a lot of, you know, lack of resources. And we can't do everything. But we need we do need to improve the app experience for um, accessible uh, use cases. Yeah, I feel that the decoupling the, the the base operating system from the apps and using technologies like Snap and Flatpak with containers also like allows uh, applications to be easily shipped everywhere, and that's really going to to improve the the access that the, the users have to to those apps. Uh, without having to learn specifics about their operating system. So this is more about using the application or fetching it from somewhere, as in consuming, fetching it, right? Like installing it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I see right now, I think that we have unique opportunity, right? There is a flat hub, like full of applications, like MicroS Desktop, for example, pulls the flat packs from flat hub rather than from internal, you know, flat hub repository. And I see like this is, you know, Ubuntu is starting with snaps, right? Like by default and so on. And I see that we have all opportunity to maybe start consuming from FatHub and join effort, you know, like provide QE, uh, I don't know, interconnect our QE with gatekeeping from Flat Hub for FlatHub and so on. But if we kind of start doing it all in our sandboxes, I feel like we will be focusing on packaging and on, on the application itself. Um, so I feel like, you know, if we can contribute uh, together consume it from a single place, like maybe join efforts with the quality assurance and focus on the application and not on the way, what is it taken from, like is it OBS or is it FlatHub? I think that we can win, but it takes some decisions to be made and uh, yeah, I, I kind of, it's tempting, right? Using your own, I don't know, build service, do it your way exactly like you want, but then we are not really collaborating, are we? Is it a cop out if I just claim his answer? Because. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know what platform that will be, but I feel like if we are really committed to working collaboratively and to solving this problem and to making Linux and open source the you know the better, the more ethical, the uh, just a better solution for people, then I, there has to there have to be less borders. You know, le less, less, like you said, less quibbling, less, um, it, there was, <laughs> there, I, you guys probably, most of you know Alan Pope, and he joked one time when I interviewed him, you know, I said, what is the solution to all of this, to getting people to adopt Linux? And he said, well, everybody should just use Ubuntu. <laughs> and <laughs> that's a really, that's a really controversial answer, but in a way, <laughs> his, his thinking was on point, you know, because... Uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying that we should do that because every distro certainly has their 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 strength but this is a long-winded way of me saying that I agree with you on that I just don't know what that platform should be what that what that hub should be but but it needs to be and, and that's that's one of those things anything that that adds a layer of confusion for your typical end user I think is a very bad thing and, and anything that makes them go, you know what, I use all these applications on Mac and Windows, but I'm just not understanding how to get these rolling here on Linux. Anything that makes them, you know, want to run back to proprietary OS, that's, that's a bad result, so. Um, I, I agree with all of that in, the, in terms of, like, collaboration is the way that we can solve this. I think just reducing friction as much as possible. And in a sense, the Linux desktop has to meet like a much, much higher bar. I don't know if anyone has recently installed Mac OS or recently installed Windows. It's terrible, right? But everyone always dings Linux OSs on the installer, like the installation, because people otherwise don't usually have to install OSs. Linux has a reputation of being technical and, and hard to access, so the moment anything goes wrong or you see any message, it's like, ah, see, I told you it was never going to work. It's too hard. I'm going to go back 
So we have to clear all of those kind of preconceptions. So every step that we can do to, to take friction away and to improve like, uh, you know, the developer process, to improve the app discoverability, like how do you find the apps that you can run on your system, how to make it easy for developers to get it in front of the users, all those things that we do, uh, reducing friction, are removing those reasons for people to stop, get confused, you know, turn a different way, find an app that doesn't work for them. And, you know, so um, it's, it's sort of, yes, all of that, but for the reason that in the marketplace, most people coming to Linux have to reinstall their computer, which is already like an extremely high bar. Um, so maybe you know, that, that Linux app discoverability sits on top of the problem of you know, who are allies in you know, OEM spaces or people who are marketing and really kind of making a, a, a push to put Linux desktops in front of people. Um, so if that happens, then all of the investment that we've made in the first boot experience, the, the app stores, the, the metadata, the icons, whatever all of those things are, will be so much more valuable because we'll have taken another hurdle away. Like how do I get a user in front of a Linux system to start with? Um, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I've been working on it for quite a while, endless, but that's, that's a big roadblock we also need to sort of factor into our landscape. Well, and I guess to remain on the apps, I think that something to uh, reflect on in the last few years, like having AppStream, for example, be part of the discussion has changed quite a lot. Like I remember when I started in Linux, like there were all of these distros with like education for people between 14 and 16 and who have like two arms, right? Like you don't need to be this specific about your operating system. Uh, the fact that you can right now uh, have an application that lists all of the software and you can have this one-on-one -on -one discussion with the developer of the app developer, it's, it's a huge advantage in, in the direction of the question. So I think that if we just do more of that, and we clearly are, then we're set. All right. Um, one second here. All right, uh, our next question. Um, the app ecosystem has improved significantly in the last few years. How can we improve the visibility of this progress to non-Linux users? And do you have the mic so you can start? I mean, uh, the biggest uh, problem I think that our young users have is that like we, you, we were saying before, we don't have the one answer. Even like the different distros don't have the one answer. Uh, we're figuring out collectively what the one answer should be, um, at least like given a context. Uh, as soon as we have one answer for ourselves, we can give that to our users. But I think that there is work to do there. And like lying to ourselves and saying that it's all figured out right now, it's also like lying to, to ourselves. We're in a, like, a multi-year path of uh, changing how the app ecosystem works in Linux and embracing that we are in a change uh, process and, well, admitting that uh, we don't have all of the answers is part of the solution, I would say. Plus one. <laughs> 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 Just before Jason got in. But, but I, yeah, I, I feel like um, that, that collaboration of, you know, for example, seeing you know, uh, SUSE, MicroOS, uh, Fedora Silver Blue, like systems that are saying, okay, great, actually, if we change how we're working, then this actually makes it easier for the user to get the applications and to, to have a system, an OS is easier to manage and applications that's easier to manage. So we, we kind of gain through collaboration and we gain allies in sending this kind of unified message that we've now made a, a better way to use your computer, a better way for applications, a better way for the OS, and you know, all of the kind of different investments that are made in different desktops or you know, different app systems and things can all then just get in front of more people more easily. So I think the story gets easier to tell because the, the kind of quality and the collaboration improves it for everyone. And once you have a story to tell, <laughs> the answer is marketing. <laughs> the answer is, to me anyway, it is every organization, KDE and GNOME and Flathub and, and Canonical and e Red Hat, everybody comes together and basically pools all their resources into forming an organization that is devoted solely to marketing the Linux operating system to non-Linux users. Doing that in a very mainstream way with big budgets and commercials and influencers. I mean, th those aren't things that you associate with Linux distros, but I really think that's what needs to happen, is we need to play the same game that everyone else is playing. 
And to do that, there needs to be a lot of money poured into it. And that's the only answer. You can't do that without money. But once you have the money and once you have a story to tell, you roll out the marketing. And, you know, it, uh, that's the gateway. And then from there, once they make that choice, they can choose, you know, our community can help them choose where to go. I say it as tricky. People are kind of trying to move people to Linux platform and, and some solutions. But I don't know, the closest to me right now, like if uh, you are trying to cover some maybe Windows use case, not necessarily Mac OS, where people need to run some Linux application, right now closest to me is WSL. We are not really running Flatpaks there. Uh, I'm also taking care of the WSL or project management around it at SUSE. And yeah, like um, running Linux applications is easy. Maybe next step could be getting something like Flatpak running in there. But right now we can do systemd, we can do some apps like Firefox and so on. It's not that much effort as people would think. So maybe that direction. Otherwise, I do agree about marketing. If you want to <laughs> increase like Linux use, use cases, like we really have to talk to students early enough so they can actually adopt that platform and make it their default, right? Can I? Um, yeah, sorry, I just it. wanted to add something because I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to ignore the app. Yeah, you know the app question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add that I feel like if you were to pull the average Mac OS or or Windows user. You know, did you know that you can use Spotify on Linux? Did you know that you can use Discord on Linux? They would have no idea. And so it's it's the education, you know. That's yeah, I definitely second what Jason said about marketing and not just this uh, gen general uses, but I think we are also better positioned than uh, the uh, proprietary platforms when it comes to privacy, when it comes to uh, uh, security. So I think that we need to make this visible to the broad community because I think there is a demand. We are living in a world of mass surveillance, a world of censorship, and I think that there is a place for us in there with what we, we already have. Like. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything everybody said, uh, but I, you know, we, we need to look at like the use cases that people are on the proprietary systems you know, have. So there are gamers, there are enterprise. I mean, WSL and Steam, you know, with Proton definitely like helps bridge some of those gaps. So that's where we can get a little bit of free marketing. If we can get some of those people to come to our platform because it you know, does what they need to do, then that's a little bit of the free marketing. Um, but yeah, definitely we, we, we need to market and just like spread the word. So does this mean that uh, all you distros will have a release video <laughs> to, uh, that talks about what your product is doing? Because you are our product, right? From a, a desktop perspective, you are productizi productizing our. When is, when is the last time that a distro has done a, rele a press release or a trailer or something on YouTube that isn't talking to existing users of that distro? Oh, yeah. Right? Of course, we do that now. Well, I, I can say that um, for Jammy Jellyfish, we contracted Freehive to do a video. Um, yeah, yeah, Ryan Gorley. It was, it was a beautiful video um, that showcased, you know, what the new features were. I mean, you're right. Like, it does kind of talk to the existing users. Maybe we got a few u new users to watch it. But I think the the release video was beautiful. It's something that we want to do in the future. Ideally, we could do it for every release. But I think right now we're looking at, like, major releases, like LTSs. Um, but it got a lot of positive feedback, and I would like to see that uh, perpetuated. Yeah, not just for our distro, but for, but for all. Yeah. I also think that we should be doing our marketing in other platforms. I feel that young generations are not consuming the same medias as uh, most of our developer in age uh, people, so we need to make <laughs> portrait, <laughs> portrait <laughs> mode yeah. videos in TikTok, yeah? Are you going to ask us something that we disagree on? <laughs> <laughs> So oh, so I'm, I'm <laughs> sure I can, I can come up with that. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know. <laughs> right. are, you, are you asking for a <laughs> challenge? <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a great question. I, and I think uh, I'll add the comment that uh, I'd like to see distros talk more. Then, because a lot of times when we do it, we, we we narrow ourselves down to desktop or whatever. And you know, a lot of distros are, are primarily a server OS versus a desktop OS, right? And so that's because our, at least for if you're RHEL or, or you know, SUSE, 
that's where your money, that's what pays everything else. But if, it, if, if the goal, if you, if you ever think about the flipping, that you could get more, that's something interesting, right? But what does the market research say? And uh, you know, coming down to business uh, kind of thing. And, and that's something, uh, th that's a conversation that you could have with, dis with desktops is what is, what is the flip? What is needed for that flip? And uh, because we have this infrastructure set up for my, primarily to have that kind of conversation. Uh, I think is, is important, right? Is, is to set that up it's because we do want a sustainable uh, 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 ecosystem as well, right? So I should have turned off. All right. So uh, this might be more of a GNOME question, but can convergent UIs become standard for app development between mobile and desktop? Or anything. Can I ask that? Please. <laughs> I think that the answer is uh, can they not, right? Like, is there like a pure desktop computer anymore? Is there a pure tablet anymore? Like, is a tablet different than a biggish phone? <laughs> or is it like a laptop with a, without a keyboard, right? So, like, the only uh, solution there is to like, figure out how to do it properly with the different uh, hardware we're gonna find, right? In the end, when we're thinking about UX, is like finding this balance or finding what's the best UI in the end between whatever hardware our users are gonna get and uh, what we can do. Um, the fact that we don't really have a tight control over which hardware we, we find our users running is definitely a challenge that way. Like other companies would have a better handle there, but as we are set up as a uh, as an ecosystem, I don't think that we uh, can be that choosy of saying no, no, no. We're not gonna support um, devices without a physical keyboard or things like that. So in the end, we need to be able to do that. Uh, I think that at the technical level, we have all of the information we need. So it's a matter of saying let's figure out the technical bits so that it happens. Right. I mean, with the GNOME hats on, I mean, we feel the same is true in KDE, but th a lot of the technical enablers for things like, you know, responsive UI that can rearrange or optimize for different screen sizes, different resolutions. So this helps not just device portability, but accessibility and, and, and different requirements that people have, um, or just having an app on the side when you have something else on the screen, like all of these things. So the technical enablers are there now and people are using them, and that's, you know, the benefit of switching to GTK4. Um, so, um, and the same thing, people are working in the shell to, to support, you know, different kind of screen aspect ratios and sizes and things. So, I think it's going fine, as far as I can tell, and I know that KDE has been working in this space, you know, probably before GNOME did, um, sort of holistically, so. <laughs> All right, no one else on do, that. Do, do right. you need any more answers beyond the KDE I and the I GNOME I one? I <laughs> like I said, it's a very, it's a, the question is slightly limiting in, in the sense that, you know, uh, you have to argue of is convergence really a, a th a, an important part of, of an ecosystem in terms of app? And some may and some may not. I'm sure there are people in this crowd who, who absolutely do believe in, in, in that. But that's okay. And I'm going to skip the next question because it sort of ties into that with, with Steam Deck. So I'm going to skip it. Um, sorry, folks. Um, So I'm going to I'm going to state this question, but I'm going to modify it because I reserve the right to modify it. <laughs> um, voice recognition has the potential to improve the experience for people in a range of situations, especially those with certain disabilities. Any plans regarding voice-based interaction in apps and the OS shell? I'm going to change this more about accessibility in general rather than just voice recognition uh, in, in a general state. What is, what is the role of accessibility and its importance? And this is something Heather kind of pointed out earlier in, in the app ecosystem. Like what does it enable? And, and, or what other things can it enable not rather than just? 
Who wants to answer that? I will say. I know you didn't want this, but on the voice front, uh, uh, we've been working with uh, Mycroft AI into trying to put together some kind of UX uh, around voice. And what I keep finding is that, um, I mean, specifically voice is like, it's loud by definition, right? Like you need to interact with your IT in a, in a very specific way. So on the UX kind of area, like you need to like think about this. And I don't think you can say, yeah, let's do voice now because now voice is great because it has a lot of connotations. Like it means you cannot use uh, like your computer when your child is asleep or anything like that, right? So I guess let's put an asterisk on it, but it's not that easy that it can be answered at least in a like, one minute kind of answer. Uh, accessibility is for sure one of the important ones, uh, something that we should be doing more, all of us. It's uh, from with my big kitty hat on, uh, it's one of our goals for the next three years to, to work on that. Carl, who is somewhere here, uh, can tell you more about the topic, but uh, we do have a bunch of work going on. And, and it's definitely very important, but on your hand, uh, well, those of us who are not like needing to use these uh, services, uh, well, we ca might struggle at times to like find the problems and the things that need uh, fixing. Um, well, in this in this area, something that we found useful is uh, trying to use the infrastructure. So, uh, for an app developer, how you uh, expose yourself into these accessibility APIs is by like sending more information into the user, right? Instead of just sending a PixMap, which what you would always do, like to put into a window, you will send a bunch more of metadata. Uh, using this metadata in your in, in, in the desktop environment, for example, can help us uh, like uh, find problems because, well, if you rely on it on other features on the on the OS, then you will um, well need it at, at some point. Obviously, that is uh, limited as well. But um, Yeah, I, I think um, plus one, but <laughs> also um, this is something that that is it's a very big and complicated space, and I, I think that there's a kind of advocacy and awareness problem that needs to be kind of tackled from both directions. So it's really hard for uh, you know an app developer to understand the ways in which their choices uh, I impact users that have accessibility needs. Um, and so just setting up the right forums for discussions to understand like, oh, okay, this is, if you do this, then this happens. And so, uh, you know, just kind of building that awareness and advocacy. You know, from the GNOME Foundation's perspective, we've um, you know, supported work on the accessibility sort of stack in GTK4. That was one of the things that kind of progressed as we moved the, um, the development experience forward. Um, and so trying to kind of correct that. I know that um, uh, some folks in the community who've also been looking at the accessibility stack and basically just doing some of the um, kind of ancient history to go and um, you know, clean up and, and make it more robust and, and better tested and, and things. So th there is work in it, but I, I think just prioritizing and funding that work depends on having a better awareness of what's valuable, what's necessary, and being able to prioritize that. Um, I, I just wanted to add that I, I think it would be really valuable. So, I mean, as, as it was pointed out, like most developers don't have the need, and so it, it's hard to kind of imagine what, what needs to happen. So if we had more tools that could help simulate an environment, um, you know, to simulate what it might look like uh, if, if someone is colorblind or what, then it might help developers be able to empathize with that situation. And also, if we had some sort of standards in place, like, you know, these requirements need to be met on the accessibility front before release is allowed, I think that that would go a long way in kind of incentivizing developers to make those changes. Yeah, 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 across the entire ecosystem. I mean, it, it should be like a blocker if accessibility is just straight up broken. Yeah. Should we get some accessibility tests in the new FlatHub OpenQA integration? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, in addition to the to the technical work that needs to be done, I also think that uh, we need to also continue doing uh, inclusivity communities to have people with accessibility needs being part of our community so we can understand better their demands. I feel that uh, the disconnect also happens because a lot of people don't have people with disabilities in their life. And I think that that connection needs to happen uh, like both ways, not just from the technical perspective, but from a community one. And I also think that uh, there is a lot of government organizations interested in compliance. So accessibility also can benefit our stack by allowing us to fit some certain beats that we are not able to, to fit in now because our software is not accessible. Yeah, it, I, I actually recently learned about the EU Accessibility Act, which uh, is, is coming for us in like 2025, I think. Um, so, coming for us. Yeah, 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 like <laughs> our, our operating <laughs> systems need to be accessible. Now, I actually like went and read the legislation to try and be like, well, how do they define accessibility? And they don't really. They do define an operating system quite well, but they don't really define what their requirements are for accessibility. But still, like it, it's, it's in the minds of uh, the government. So you know, we will have to comply at some point with that. And so starting sooner than later is important. Yeah, maybe just iteration on what's already said. I remember it was on last DEF CON, the big one, that there was somebody who was actually demoing like the good, you know, like UI versus the bad UI. And I think it was actually voice communication for blind people and reading like 100 options that you could click on, like that wasn't super useful, plus it took five minutes to hear it, you know, and then you forgot about what was in the beginning. So yeah, it's important and some gate, yeah. And, and it was, uh, I feel like um, the gatekeeping, if you would actually use single platform where to consume applications for like, then you can set some requirements. And I think that would help, yeah. But again, more workshops would be better. Like um, as inclusion of somebody who may have a handicap in the community helps. And if you don't have the, you know, if there is no, no person then inviting guests who can actually introduce you to the problematics would help. And we don't have anybody on us, right? Maybe next time we should. The good news about this, uh, Lukash was uh, presenting. He's now working with us in GTK, so he's going to be improving our stack. Uh, so I, uh, one thing I would add about accessibility uh, as a, is if you get the story right of accessibility, that that is a huge story, like an enabling story for the app ecosystem. Um, I have met individuals who um, who lost the ability to program, but if they had proper um, uh, assistant te technology, can can move from being disabled to being productive, and and it's 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 actually a hard problem because of the interfacing with hardware, which a lot of these assistive technologies need. But if we're able to do that, it, it, it's it's an extremely compelling story. Going going back to your, your uh, comment, Jason, about marketing and telling a story, and as you as well, Rob. Um, these are like focusing on this really drives our 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 general need to help people. Why do we write software, right? To help people. It's been our kind of motivations from the beginning. So uh, it's one of those things um, th that I think is really important that we focus on. Uh, all right. So uh, this one is a a bit of a this is my question. So I'm going to, I'm going to, how are Snaps and Flatpak helping to build a market for apps? How can developers sustain themselves while still adhering to FOSS principles? This is really more geared towards distros than it is. I think if we uh, do what we can, um, to enable all types of packaging so that people can choose. I think that's ideal. Um, if we are limited in what we are allowed to enable, then it shouldn't be that difficult. We can write tutorials. Um, there can be applications out there that can help kind of bridge the gaps and make that experience a little bit easier. Um, but there is some shared technology there, right? There's the portals. Um, and so 
one way that Flatpak and Snap developers can come together to improve the total ecosystem there is by contributing to the portals and reviewing the merge requests and you know making sure that we have each other's interests in mind as well so that we can come to a collaborative solution. Oh, did you? Thanks. Uh, let's see. Sustainability for the developers. Yes. That is what I think is, uh, that needs to be the first priority in my mind, is having the existing hubs that we have come together in a very almost aggressive way to enable developers to monetize their work. That's, that's I mean, otherwise, what it, you know, what is the incentive besides, it's a nice to have goodwill, and it's nice to have passion for what you're doing, but if we want to see the app ecosystem on Linux really blow up and really blossom, and, and really have alternatives to everything that's out there on proprietary OSs, you need to, you need to, <laughs> make that sustainable for developers and for open source organizations. And I think, um, you know, I think App Center for Everyone, the, I don't know what the progress on that is. The elementary started that. Um, App Center for Everyone where they were enabling donations and, and things like that. But um, yeah, that's, I guess that's my, <laughs> my answer is just find a way to enable very easy uh, a revenue flow for the developers wherever their app lives on Linux. I think that the biggest thing uh, we've missed as app developers in the like traditional Linux uh, well, area was that there was no like one-to-one -one re relationship between user and developer, right? Uh, I think that the money, like the financial flow, is just one channel, something that you need to talk about, but you also need to talk about the features you need, you need to talk about the uh, bugs you have, and it, it was a problem, like we've all seen this, oh, I have this problem with this app, well, but this, my distro has this version, and you need to have this other one, but you don't, cannot have it because it's unstable, even though it, it doesn't have uh, this fix, so um, we're moving into an area where like this is suddenly possible and and it's about like enabling this communication which is suddenly direct and then it makes sense to give money like why why would you give money to somebody if they cannot fix the thing that you have on your on your operating system running if they cannot add a feature on your application if they cannot fix a bug as soon as you have this communication on the other hand where things get to be fixed you can have a conversation that is much more meaningful be it through euros or otherwise right Even if you skip the monetizing aspect, like one fight that I see on our distro side is like, we, we really are tied to OBS, like anything that we package for open source, right? And so actually like, uh, you know, suddenly we are asking maybe developers to consider using flat packs and so on, and you have to come with some, okay, so what's the benefit for the contributor, for the, for the developer, right? And sometimes it's kind of difficult to, to tell them, hey, yeah, if you do it once, then it will work on all of these distributions, right? You will not have to package it for Leap, you will not have to package it for Tumbleweed, I don't know, for Slash, for, for Leap 16, separately it will just work. But uh, I feel like um, there's a lot of benefits really, aside from the monetization, which is the direct feedback, as you said, like you suddenly see rating for your applications, you are doing this wrong, you know? And the direct communication really helps kind of un start understanding how people are using your application and yeah, I feel like uh, if you realize that you can just maybe package it once and it will run on you know several versions of the distributions, that's a big benefit and people need to see it. Same with containers essentially, but yeah, I think <coughs> if, if we go over that obstacle and, uh, and developers or you know, in our case, mostly maintainers will understand, I think then yeah, that, that helps. So um, I guess part of the reason I asked that question um, is I think a lot of, oh. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, this, 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 intermediate, bleh, this intermediation point is like a, a precondition that we have to get right to open this direct discussion. Um, there's a lot of other sort of detail points, and you know, I've been looking at this in the context of Flat Hub as, okay, payments, well, that's legal, that's agreement, that's governance, that's transparency, that's trust. There's a whole list of things that need to be 
you know, good and, and the technology, right? How do you take a payment and where do you send it and all of this stuff? So, so there's, a, there's a big list of things that need to be sort of sorted before we can say, okay, great, to that sort of direct relationship between the developer and the user, we can also add a financial element. So we're working on it, watch the space. Um, I think um, the other part of your question was around open source. Uh, you know, and how, how does this sit with our values? Um, and I think that transparency and that community accountability piece is something that you know we're we're going slowly in FlatHub and we're having things like the focus group and things because we see that we need to maintain the trust of all the different stakeholders. So whether that's you know folks working in OS land, whether that's folks working on different desktop systems, whether that's developers and applications, um, we need to maintain that trust so that we have that transparency and that kind of togetherness as a community uh, and that we're not just kind of doing something. Um, I mean, I, I am being pushy. So to Jason's point is like, we should just do it. I, I am trying to just do it within the confines of, you know, a nonprofit and all of these things that we kind of, um, but that's not a great yeah. And, and I think that's what, what that's those values and that kind of transparency and accountability, the source code being there um, and the fact that we develop collaboratively as a community, those are the things that will get us to uh, an app store experience or donation experience or something like that that still respects the kind of common values that bring us together as a community. So uh, this isn't about the software license, but it's about how we kind of behave and how we, we kind of trust each other and, and work towards the same goal. I believe we are out of time. So mwah, mwah. You, w you want one more question? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't think this is a music concert. One right more song. Cool. <laughs> you want me? You want me to ask an AI question? All right. Um, where do you see the role of? Uh, so AI is a big thing right now. Like, uh, in fact, nearly having to unlock. Uh, there's so much money being thrown by Amazon and Microsoft and whatnot, and uh, you can see this is where people are wanting to invest money. And so when, they, when looking upon the app ecosystem, where is the role, how do we align with AI or should we align at all? What is, what is our value proposition to, to where we're going with, um, with that? I think this question needs a lot of curating. Do you mean using the AI? You mean creating AIs? You mean? What? <laughs> Having AIs make apps? <laughs> yeah, we said folded collectively. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, oh, you, got five, you all have five seconds. I gotta wrap this up. Huh? <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, there are like four different answers to your question, and it depends whether you look at copyright, whether you look at, at freedom and inequality, whether you look at the economics, and whether you look at technology. Which one do you want? Uh, <laughs> Ten <laughs> seconds. Hold Whatever. <laughs> you to pick which one you're passionate about. Um, I think the freedom one is worth hitting. The economics seem a little overblown, um, but let's set that aside. Better than crypto. Um, the, the freedom one I worry about because it's kind of entrenching this uh, kind of big tech inequality of control. So this technology requires you to have you know, low paid workers in some global south country who go and s sit and look at a bunch of millions of answers and then tag them. It's like, oh, can't have that, um, you know, child abuse, can't have that too violent, can't have that racist, whatever. You have to do that. You have to pay one of those people 25 cents or whatever to look at an answer and then train it back into your system. OpenAI have been doing that for quite a long time. They have a lot of training data that's suitably tagged. No one else has that. So lots of AIs that are created that are accidentally racist or you know, accidentally discriminatory or whatever. Um, so this is terrible, right? You can't just go and hoover up the internet and train a language model and like, great, I've got AI. Like Stanford had one that ran on very low resource devices and they had to stop the project because they had put online a very like, you know, not acceptable <laughs> um, uh, system. So just from the context of, you know, if we together, you know, Linux desktop developers wanted to bring AI into our system, then we don't have that resource of millions of, uh, of dollars to throw at building a training corpus and, and, you know, filtering it and tagging it and all of these things. So if we thought the cloud computing was kind of a bit sucky, like, you know, st steal our software first and then steal our data and then rent it back to us, it's like, well, now it's actually stealing our knowledge and renting that back to us as well. So I feel like, you know, the, a collective community response to the inequality of you have to have Google or Facebook or Microsoft over levels of resource to even enter this space in a way that makes the technology possibly useful um, worries me. 
I don't have an answer, but you know, they, they, this seems to entrench the inequalities that already exist, right? You have to have big money to enter this space in a useful way. Yeah, yeah, and, and training the model costs you know, X million and, and, and kills 10 polar bears and you know, all that stuff, so yeah. So I, do, you, do you need to have that much? Do you need to have billions? I mean, Sony is Sony's partnering with Raspberry Pi to ship an on-device AI chip that has you know, facial recognition features and things that runs on a Pi. And that's AI, right? I mean, so it depends. So my machine learning generally, I, was, I guess I was thinking about large language models. Oh, okay. So like a chat GPT, like, you know, Bing is going to talk to me or whatever, like yeah, yeah. this kind of stuff, like yeah. languages, yeah. broad space. I, 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 think, I think AI can serve as a wonderful assistant um, if it's kept in check, <laughs> you know? I think, I think as a community, we all, we really have to come together and figure out how to integrate it ethically because it is going to get integrated in, in our proprietary competitors' products. They are going to integrate it, and they're going to spend a lot less time worrying about the privacy and the ethics involved than we are. So like, we can't do this in silos. We have to come together and figure out the solution. Because I think it's happening, whether we like it or not. Maybe a different take that wasn't taken here. So from a copyright perspective, we are really, really worried. Like we have currently a regulation that we shouldn't really use any sort of AI per programmer for assisted code generation because of the copyright uh, concern. But where we are actually currently looking in is usage for translations and the discussion that we've had like a week ago, like no documentation, it's still copyright subject translations. And I've seen wonderful things being done within one week, like the entire game translation, the initial version usable within a week. Uh, and I think that's that's very interesting, especially like not all distributions are translating to all languages, and now we have like option to do it like on a decent quality, you know, in a very short iterations. I can imagine just uh, you know you hit RC, AI give me translations, and it's done like within a week or two, and then people just just go for results. Is it readable, right? And I feel like there you you don't have to worry about copyright, and you can still get value right now, like not in Europe, but now, yeah. So that's that's what we are looking into. Costs money though, yeah. yeah. It's not for free. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Jason's right. It's here whether we like it or not. So, um, and people are going to use it for writing their code whether we like it or not. Uh, so it's really, really important. I mean, it's always been important that we keep our documentation up to date, but now it's really important because that's where a lot of this stuff is being taken from. Someone is asking ChatGPT to describe how a technology works, it's gonna be pulling from documentation. And if that documentation is out of date, then that just perpetuates the issue. So it, it just, I think it highlights that documentation is very important um, to be up to date, uh, you know, code that uses it, that's out in GitHub, should be up to date with the latest um, methods. I, yeah, I, I think, we we must deal with it <laughs> and and really take this opportunity to reevaluate our documentation and, and make sure it's good. Well, that's great. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up the time, but I want to leave you all with one thought about the ethical system. There is no other ecosystem that's valuing this on a target team or a change team. something amazing for people. And because of that, we do we can care about safety. We can care about um, uh, all these other things because we have that product. We have so when when you say when my family say why should we be part of this ecosystem, I think safety is the biggest superstar that we have to be part of. Thank you very much.